Hi everyone, Wonia Thibault here with Buckskin Revolution and I have been waiting so long to carve out the time to put together a video for you guys about one of the best things in the world. And that is brain tanned buckskin. So brain tanning is one of the great passions of my life. I spend a lot of time tanning deer hides to make beautiful brain tanned buckskin and teaching people to do so and making buckskin clothes and teaching about buckskin clothing and buckskin sewing in general. So it seemed really important to round that out with a nice overview of how you go about turning raw deer skins into one of the most amazing, durable, comfortable, breathable, wonderful smelling substances on the planet. So why brain tan buckskin? Well, for starters, when you're interacting with it, it's very easy to see that it is very different from your standard leathers. So it has an amazing smoky smell and a wonderful soft velvety smooth texture. But additionally, it is way more soft and stretchy, flexible and breathable than other leathers. Additionally, it can take getting wet and dry and wet and dry, and it stands up well to human sweat whereas most other leathers break down if they're getting wet and dry and don't do well with human sweat. So those are some of the things that are obvious about it. It's beautiful color and texture and smell and wearability, but there are a lot of other things less obvious. So one is that unless you spend time in circles that are practicing ancestral skills or with native peoples in different areas around the world, probably the only leather you have encountered in your life is tanned with the industrial process that we know of as chrome tanning. So it's using chromium salts and chromium, chromium acids to tan the hides. And this is a really gnarly, toxic process. It involves all kinds of heavy metals and all kinds of toxins and it's so gnarly and environmentally degrading that it's not even allowed to be done in the United States. We ship our tanning industry over to other countries that don't have the kind of environmental regulations that we have. So it's really hard on the environment, really hard on the people who live anywhere around it where all of those toxics toxic materials are being dumped, really hard on the people working in the factories having to interact with that, hard on the leather, it degrades the leather so that it doesn't stand up as well, and hard on you if you're wearing it where you're potentially absorbing some of those heavy metals into your skin. So brain tanning is amazing from that perspective, an environmental perspective, and the fact that you can tan this at home with a minimal of tools with all natural materials that you find around you in the environment. So it's amazing on so many levels and there's something else about it beyond all of the practical things, which is just that I feel like there's something about buckskin that is so magical for so many people. And I believe it's because all of us can trace our ancestry back to someone who wore buckskin or something very like it in their daily life. It is an integral, integral part of human history. Learning to tan hides is what allowed people to expand from the warm tropical areas into other places around the climate. So we owe our very existence to leather very similar to buckskin. Something like it was tanned on almost every continent where you find humans. And I believe that there's some part of us deep inside that knows and remembers that, that we have an ancestral memory of wearing buckskin. I wear buckskin all the time in my daily life and I have all kinds of people from all walks of life coming up to me all the time, fascinated, wanting to just touch my clothes or wanting to hear more about them because there's something about it that just draws people in. So that's part of why I'm so enthusiastic about buckskin. It's the magic that it holds and its capacity to remind us who it is to live as humans deeply in touch with the world around us and in the process of making the goods we need with our own two hands and reminds us that we're part of the natural world instead of separate from it. So that's why I call my business Buckskin Revolution. It's not just that I would love to see people wearing buckskin. It's about what buckskin represents on a deeper level and that connection to our human history and to the land around us. So that my friends, is why I'm excited to share with you the process of brain tanning and hopefully get you as hooked on it as I am.
So I've been tanning hides since 1995, and I'm filming this in 2019. So as of this fall, it will be 15, uh, 25 years, 15, ha, huh, 25 years of tanning hides, and they are still just as magic to me, magical to me as ever. And part of that is the alchemy of watching this funky, what a lot of people consider waste product of hunting into an amazing product. So I wanna walk you through the different stages that a hide goes through in order to become brain tan buckskin. So this one is obviously dried, not fresh off of the deer. But so we start out with a raw skin. So this one was skinned and then fleshed to cut all of the meat fat membrane that might still be on it. I'm gonna go in more details in skinning and tell you why you shouldn't ever have to have meat and fat on your hides. But sometimes it happens. So this was fleshed to have everything removed besides the skin itself and then staked out to dry flat. And like this, it can be stored for some time so long as you don't let the critters get to it. And by critters, I mean dogs and ravening predators searching the area for something delicious, but also small things like wool moths and hide beetles will attack buckskin. So you have to store them well. So that's the first stage. And then the next stage is scraping it. And it's going to require some prepping to get it ready for scraping. And we'll go into that in a later stage. Um, but then it's going to be scraped, which is removing the top layer of the skin, the part where the hair grows. So scraping off the hair and the top layer, what we call the grain, which is essentially the shiny leather or the shiny layer on our skin and on the outside of standard leather, like boot leather. And that is going to be, um, a substance that's going to keep the hide dressing from getting into it and it's also going to allow the hide to give and stretch and pull and breathe more so buckskin is more similar to suede in that it doesn't have that grain layer but it's different because it stands so much better and is so much more soft and stretchy um, but so this is a hide that has been scraped fully and then again tacked out and allowed to dry and it also can be stored for some time like this a little bit less um, less vulnerable to wool moths when it's in this stage and hide beetles also tend not to hit these hides quite as much because they don't have the protection of the hair to hide in but still can potentially be vulnerable so here is a scraped hide ready for softening and now here is a hide that was partway softened and then stopped and dried and this is actually half of an elk hide so this is a substantial hide and then I cut it into to hand soften it instead of frame soften. So this has been taken a little bit further into dressing and partial softening and then stored dry. And here, my friends, between these two stages is where the real magic happens. So this is a softened hide. So you can see, look at the way it flows, right? It is so soft and stretchy and luxurious and beautiful. So this has been fully softened, but not yet smoked. So a lot of people think that that leather is naturally a brown color because it's been either brain tanned buckskin, which is smoked, or bark tanned, which dyes the hide, or in the case of, again, most of the leather you've ever seen in your life, chrome tanned, which actually turns the hides a kind of a gray blue because of the weird chemicals in there. And then it's dyed brown or yellow sometimes in the case of chrome tan buckskin to make it look like the natural product. But it's all just a farce. So hides, the actual substance of skin, are actually white. And it's the other processes that give them their color. So this is a beautiful, wonderfully soft hide. But if this was to get wet, it would turn right back into hard, stiff rawhide, essentially, because there are glues in the hide. And just like any glue, like think of Elmer's white glue, it can just be sitting there not tacky, and then you get it wet, and all of a sudden it's a tacky glue again. So if this was to get wet, those glues would become tacky, and they would glue all of the fibers down hard, just like happened to this one, partially softened and then let dry. So in order to keep that from happening, the final stage of buckskin is smoking. So we put two hides together, usually, or a larger hide, you can sew it in half and turn it into a bag and then funnel smoke from a fire of, well, from smoldering rotten wood into that bag so that the hide becomes smoked. And that is what gives it its color. And the smoking denatures the glues 
in the hide so that it can then get wet without those glues being activated. And this can be wet and dry and wet and dry and stay in beautiful, lovely buckskin. And this is again, a finished smoked buckskin, but this one has been dyed with black walnut. So here are a bunch of different stages of hides in the processing. So before we get into the steps of the brain tanning process, let's talk a little bit about the structure of animal skin and what brain tanning is actually doing. So skin is made up of all of these different long protein fibers that are microscopic and they're all going every which way, just kind of held in a loose matrix with one another and they're all independently moving. Now in amongst those protein fibers are all kinds of other things. There's other proteins and there's carbohydrates and a lot of those things act as glues once they dry out. So there are three different layers of animal skin. There's the grain, which is the outer layer, and this is the part that's waterproofing and means that we're not going to swell up like a sponge when we go out into a rainstorm. So it keeps the inside in and the outside out. And then there's the dermis, which is the middle part of the skin. And then there's the membrane, which is these loose protein fibers that slowly get looser as they go between the dermis and the muscle of the animal. So the three layers are different and what we're after for brain tan buckskin is just the middle layer, the dermis. And that layer is going to be water penetrable once you remove the grain and it's going to be really strong unlike the membrane layer. So in this thin area you can kind of see the protein fibers. And here is the membrane side where the fibers are a lot looser and further apart. So what brain tanning does is it's actually preserving the skin in a state more similar to the skin of a living animal than any other style of tanning. And in fact, the word tanning is kind of a misnomer with brain tanning because the brains aren't changing the nature of the hide. What they're doing is they're getting into the internal structure of the hide and they're depositing their fats there, which means they're lubricating all of those protein fibers so that they can slide past one another even when dry like they did when the skin was a living skin and had moisture keeping those proteins moving. So brains are unique in that they're one of the few fats that's actually soluble in water, right? Most oils just form a slick on water, but brains are one thing that is naturally emulsified, very small fats, very small particles with natural emulsifiers. Egg yolks are another thing. Similarly, if you mix egg yolks with water, they just go right into them, right? You can also use a very, very fine oil, like a neat's foot oil or a fish oil, beaten into water with a little bit of soap to help break it up and make it more soluble in water. So when we soak the hide in that solution, because we've taken off the grain layer, the waterproof layer, that water can pass through the hide. And as it does so, it brings those small fats with them and then leaves them on the protein fibers. There are still a bunch of glues in there though. So if we just left the hide out on its own, those fats would, wouldn't protect the fibers from gluing together. What they do is they make it possible for us to physically manipulate those fibers as the hide is going from, dry, from wet to dry so that those glues don't set up. So I like to think of it as all of these little fibers coated in Elmer's glue. And even if you greased those fibers, if you just let them sit there, as they dried, they would turn into a solid hard mass. But if they're greasy enough that you can keep moving them past one another as they dry, then at the end, you'll have a pile of individual strings that are still loose and flexible. So that's what we're doing with brain tanning. And it's not truly tanned because tanning implies a change in the actual physical structure of the proteins. And that's something that the sub substance that we call tannins do. Brains aren't doing that. The only part of the process that's actually physically changing the hide is the smoking at the end because that's making those glues not work and it's kind of keeping the hide the way it was when you softened it. So in that way, smoke tanning is actually a more proper term than brain tanning. So 
Well, let's go through the different stages of the tanning process. And I have these broken up into several parts because it's a lot and a bit of a complicated process. So take all of these videos one at a time as you choose or all together if you're on a mad tanning frenzy.